Hello, my dear children. Welcome to another story about the history of our world, the land of Gothessa and the planet of Nirene. From the sands of Africa to the fjords of Norsica, the battlefields of England and the ancient wonders of Austria, this is the lore of Blood of the Wolf King. Today we will be looking at several maps of our world, so join me, my fellow cartographers, on this journey. The first set of maps we will be analysing were drafted by Gerald Waldseemuller. We will begin with his map of Gothessa, which was originally published in 1475. In the year 1480 he made changes to the map and republished it, which is the map that is being displayed before you. We will go from east to west starting with the region known as the Lower Steppes. The tribal councils of Kurzan are the remnant of the Mangala invasion still in Gothessa. They settled just beyond the Dali wasteland. Here they would begin to develop their own culture and even marry locals, creating an ethnicity called the Quemanas. Going west we arrive at Slovana and the Duchy of Uslana. Both countries hug the Lake of St. Jaeger. To the south is the Kingdom of Wallachia. This country had long been the first line of defense against the Ottomanian Empire, after the fall of Constantine. The people of Wallachia fought in many border wars, which led to them becoming quite the hardy people. Since the Kingdom of Turka gained independence in 1474, Wallachia has not been subject to invasion, but that doesn't mean things are peaceful. There are still occasional border skirmished and tensions are high. Going west we arrive in the region of Rumia. The nations here thrive from trade along the Bloodset coast, named so for all of the bloody conflicts with the Ottomanians. The Bloodset nations are Zargoza, Balgata and Dobricha. At the entrance of scholars we find the Duchy of Tolmba, a popular spot for merchants to stop and rest on their journey through the Great Channel. Further north is Vilekia and Wernberg. Then we enter the land of Austria, the largest region of Ostenhofen. The Kingdom of Bomeria is famous for its many battles against the Mangala. They held the line for as long as they could, but the invasion would be stopped in Eisenstadt. It was here that the people of Ostenhofen would begin their counterattack. Going further north, we arrive at the Wolfsreich or Wolfkonigsland to outsiders. The Wolfsreich is an ancient nation and its namesake is that of the Wolf King, who met his end in these lands. It's surrounded by the Vandal Goth kingdoms of Vermegoth, Vermegoth, and Astrogoth. Going west, we will find the Grand Duchy of Weiss, the most prosperous nation in Ostenhofen and the seat of power in Austria. Much of their wealth comes from merchants and trade along the Great Channel as well as plentiful resources further inland. To the north is Kleovet, a small nation but well known for its strange and seemingly unnatural ancient ruins. Further north is Namalund. The shipwrights of Namalund are famed across Gothessa. They recruit fleets of merchants and nobles to fight pirates and keep trade routes safe. The most known escapade of the pirate hunters was in the Battle of Derby in 1398. Going back east, we will find the Kingdom of Polenia. This nation is no stranger to struggle. Throughout the years, they have been invaded by kingdoms from all sides, and yet they still persevere. Many that have sought to conquer Polenia have fallen, while Polenia still stands. The country is mostly swamplands, with fertile farms in its center and mountains in the south. Finally, we visit Ustilut, a nation that is most known for its silver and iron exports. Its many mountain ranges and hills are full of rich ore, and miners brave the dangers of the underground to extract it. This has led to the country becoming quite rich, the third richest in Ostenhofen. With that, we leave Austria for the eastern flanks. Here we see the nations of Latvia, Kingdom of Novograd, Duchy of Kievan, and the Kingdom of Ukraine. Further east is the Sardom of Raskov. Raskov is dominated mostly by wilderness and vast farmlands. Its people live tough lives between the humid summers and brutally cold winters. The largest city in Raskov is that of its capital, Moskava. Now onto the region of Scipio. We start with Erzonia, a small nation characterized by steep cliffs and sharp mountains which are perfect for defense. Almost every settlement in the country has some sort of castle built around the strategic topography. A common phrase among travelers is, 
You can't go five feet in Ozonia without running into a castle. Next is the Black Tempest Order, a nation ran by the remnants of the Knights Templaris Order. After they were considering a threat and excommunicated in the 13th century, the Knights Templaris fled to two places where they formed new governments and stood their ground. The Black Tempest was the first Templaris nation to rise, and the second was the Order of Malta in the Tirithian Sea. Their government is ran not by nobles, but rather a unique class of people called Sanctus Nobilis, or noble clergy. Their nobility is expected to be holy warriors and theologians, as well as fulfilling their duties to their vassals. The nation is also very strict when it comes to trade, and refuse to do any business with merchants that use slaves. They are also one of the only nation in Gothessa that enforce anti-slavery laws. The land is characterized by mostly flat lowlands and swamps. However, there is an odd number of saint statues dotting the landscape, more so than most places. Now let us move west to the Duchy of Nornvai. Its coastline stretches across the northern part of the Reaper's Sea, which gives it access to sea trade. Nornvai is famous for the sharp cliffs along its coastline and the many villages that are built around its caves and inlets. To the west is Jornberg. Most of the countries in Scipia are a mix of Norsecan, Raskovian and Ustrian cultures, forming the unique culture of Scipia. Jornberg was the first place in Scipia settled by the Norsecans. Speaking of, it's time we go to Norsica. Across the Veneris Strait you will find the country of Cornia. A large swath of lowlands exists between the mountains in the heart of the nation, creating fertile land for farms. Following the largest fjord in the country, you will end up at the Lake of the Abandoned in the north. Many have tried to explore this odd lake, but no one has ever returned, and no one dares go looking for these intrepid adventurers, which has led to the lake's infamous name. Heading west, we find the lands of Nilsia and Savonlinja, both famous for their production of frostbite. As of 1480 Divine Regnum, these nations are vassals of Rotgard. Rotgard is a country characterized by harsh, rugged mountains and permafrost. This means there is little fertile land for farming, so Jotgard relies on the crops and frostbell from its vassalized states. We will now visit the Reichtum of Svenland, the largest and most prosperous nation in Norsica. It has been ruled by the family of Sven for centuries. It boasts a large retinue of men-at-arms and has its own shipwrights. At one time, they ruled the entirety of Norsica until the Revolt of Kings in 1233. Next, we travel to England. But before we set sail, let us stop at the Four Island Alliance. These islands were first settled by Norsicans in the 10th century. Rival clans established settlements here to help with raiding the mainland. These clans would fight each other as much as outsiders, until the ascension of King Sven I. After Sven announced his campaign to unite Norsica, the clans came together under Hadvar the Iron Fist and united under a single alliance. Since then, they have maintained their independence, although there is still a lot of political infighting between the various clans that make up the alliance. Now we cross the Sea of Banshees, the Apostles' Sea, and the Strait of St. Paul, so reach the bountiful land of England. England was once an almost completely united state under King Ethelstan, who ascended the throne in 922 DR coins with his face would circulate throughout England, solidifying him as its true king. Under his grandson, King Sithran, the Norsicans would invade. Beginning sometime in the early 11th century, the Norsican invasions would shape the island's future. The clans would war for its land for nearly two centuries. In 1192, the king of the Kingdom of Normania, Charles the Lionheart, invaded England with a force of nearly 10,000. After a decade of sustained bloodshed, in 1203 at the Council of Londinium, a treaty would be signed. Lords from all across the island met at a barge on the river Tamesis to agree on new borders. Since then, the established countries of England have remained largely unchanged. In 1209, construction would begin on the Bridge of Albion that stretches across the river Tamesis, supposedly built in the same place as the signing of the treaty. Upon his death, King Charles the Lionheart would split his territory between his two sons, King John I, who would receive the crown of England, and King Charles II, who would receive the kingdom of Normania. But there was one problem. The Lionheart had a third son, an illegitimate with a mistress. His name was Philip, and he was filled with jealousy. 
1215, he led a revolution sponsored by the new Frunreich and successfully overthrew King Charles II, becoming the new Duke of Normania. Going further west across the Strait of Gnomes, we arrive at Breifly. King Slain Magdela was the first to unite the island under the Kingdom of Breifle in 896 DR. The kingdom would last centuries until 1078. A rival clan in the north would revolt against Breifle, forming the Kingdom of Kyansil. Since then, the region has fractured more and more. Now we shall move south of the North Channel. The new Frunreich is an ancient nation. Originally, it was united under King Zell Capet in 987. The nation would join the HAE only a few years later in 994. In 1206, a war would begin brewing. Nobles from the countryside had become disillusioned with the royal government and would overthrow it. The king sent his wife, children and several retainers to the loyalist faction on the Isle of St. Michael. There they would form the exiled kingdom, a nation that has all but cut off contact with the outside world. To the east is the kingdom of Rianlund, a nation named so due to its bordering of the Rian River. Below that is the Chevalreich, a nation famous for its horse warriors. Now let us go further south to the Ibernica Peninsula. This land has seen strife for many years. In the early 9th century, there were three caliphates that invaded from northern Africa. They toppled several kingdoms, but in the end were unable to take the entire peninsula. There would be several centuries of conflict before a lasting peace would finally be made. In 1199, all nations in the peninsula would sign the Imperial Charter. This included the Islamic kingdoms of Provincia and Cora. The Crown of Caspia is the largest nation in the peninsula, but not the richest. They are known for their wine. Many merchants risk their lives on the seas just to trade Caspian wine. They are called wine runners. Ciprigal is famed for its olives. Many say the olives grown here are just as good as those in the Olympian League, but at nearly half the price. After the Ottomanian Empire took the holy city of Constantine, they took control of the trade routes with the east. With increased tariffs, many Gothessen traders were no longer able to afford to buy spices coming along the Silk Road. Since the 1480s, Kuprigal merchant fleets have gone on exploratory expeditions to discover a new route to the east. In doing so, they founded outposts along the west coast of Africa. This opened up new avenues of trade, which has led to them becoming quite rich. Now there is even talks of an expedition beyond the Great Expanse to find a way to circumvent the globe and trade with the East directly. Going East, you will encounter Berberia Acantilado, a nation founded by Caspians and invaded by North Africans many times. For centuries, there was a caliphate that controlled the southern part of the island, but after many years of peace, the people of Berberia Acantilado united together. Now they have a unique culture that mixes that of African and Caspian. This is also a place where the Divinians, the de facto religion of Gothessa, and the Islahamic live in peace. The Order of Malta is the second Templaris nation. Here many treasures that were taken during the Crusades are housed. Some say there are miles of underground tunnels that are full of gold and relics. Now we go to Italia. The ancient city of Rema was once the capital of the Eternian Empire. Now it sits as the head of the Western Church. The nation that encompasses it is the old Papal See. Despite its small size, its political influence reaches almost every part of the HAE. The incredible architecture of the city of Rima and the massive church at its center has attracted artists and engineers alike. The church is so large that clouds can even form inside its massive cupola. The Kingdom of Vercelli is the largest nation in Italia. The region has been ruled by the Orsini family since the time of the Eternians. After the collapse of the empire, the nobles in southern Italia flocked to the Orsini for protection, forming the Kingdom of Vercelli, named after King Vercelli Orsini I, who would be the first king of Vercelli. The Kingdom of Siena was once divided into five warring factions after the collapse of the empire. In 756, Peter Siena would finally conquer the region and form the kingdom. Now let us go north to a place divided by war and political intrigue, the crown of Lothargia. Lothargia is a successor state of the Charlemagne conquests, which was the predecessor to the HAE. The region was disputed by the sons of Charlemagne the Great for many centuries. Even after joining the HAE, 
the nobles in this country continue to fight for the throne. There were three sons that fought for this land, Jarvis Charlemagne, Charles Charlemagne, and Moses Charlemagne. The three sons would feud has continued to their families, each family being named after the son who led that family centuries ago, the Jarvinians, Charlens, and Mosons. Due to this blood feud, the Lethargians have grown a reputation for being distrustful and untrustworthy. The constant backstabbing and political subterfuge has become a normal part of life in these lands. There have been many peasant republics across Gothessa, but never a noble republic. That is what makes the Dutch Republic such a unique nation. The country is made up of city-states that are unified under a constitution that gives landowners the right to vote for a new king every 10 years. They also have a commons house. The nobles elect members of the house to vote on laws, usually those pertaining to taxes. Next is the nation of Flanders. This region is famous for its ancient woods and massive trees. Some trees are so large that entire villages are built into them. More famous than that is the curious Lavendel Welder, a large forest in the southern part of the country. The leaves of the odd oaks that grow here are tinted lavender. Local folklore tells a tale of a young man who fell in love with a beautiful woman whose family had built a castle deep in the forest. She was the daughter of a rich earl and he a lowly courier. Yet he would make deliveries to the castle every month, and every month he saw her in a long lavender dress. The two would fall in love, but the Earl did not approve. He would have the courier killed. When she found out her own father killed the man she loved, her grief was so overwhelming that it caused the trees to take root deep in the castle. The walls would crumble, and she would be joined with the oaks, turning the leaves her favorite color. This is just one of many such tales trying to explain to odd appearance of the woodland. Next we visit the Gothic Confederation. After the fall of the Eternian Empire, this region known as Low Gothic was home to nearly 30 countries. By 952, there were only eight. After seeing the rise of the HAE, they had decided to do something similar and unite under the Mott Treaty to protest each other from outside threats. Only a few short years later, in 964, the Gothic Confederation would sign the Imperial Charter. Going north, sandwiched between the Confederation and the Great Walderen, is a collection of divided states. This area, known colloquially as the Fracture Gap, is one of the most divided regions on the continent. Many of the families that preside in the Gap have been feuding over land, resources and other things for centuries. Some of them don't even remember what they were fighting over, yet hate each other nonetheless. Finally, we arrive at the Great Walderen, the seat of the Imperial House of the HAE. The Emperor sits on his throne in the capital of Berland and oversees the affairs of the Empire. Despite his grand title, he actually does very little to affect the politics of the continent. There have only been a handful of emperors strong enough to gain the support needed to make meaningful change. Instead of governing, he spends most of his time navigating the complex political landscape of the HAE. Meanwhile, his wife presides over the country of Walderen itself. Traditionally, she acts as just a figurehead, while the Grand Steward is the one that handles the true governance. However, there have been a number of queens that insist on their power to rule and take their position of governance seriously. Now let us take a moment to rest. There is still much to explore in the world of Nairene, but that will be an adventure for another time. Join me again, children, in part two, and we will continue to explore the wonderful maps of our world.